you're busy, you've got a decent practice, but nobody wants to be decent. You want to be great, and you want to have a great practice. So how do the most productive, profitable dentist in the nation balance real life, work, and profits, and somehow make it all seem fun? Well, it comes down to simple, everyday practices. So grab a lunch, join us as we chat with top clinicians and influencers to discover their formula for uncommon success. Are you ready? Then it's time to explore everyday practices with Vicki McManus-Peterson and Dr. Chad Johnson. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us again this week for part two of our discussion with Dr. Roy Shelburne about his experience of being convicted of healthcare fraud. We're rejoining the conversation as Dr. Shelburne, my co-host, Regan Robertson, and I discuss the impact definitions have. Here we go. Well, I'll, I'll share something else with you. Um, told you I was charged with healthcare fraud, racketeering, and money laundering. The Supreme, I was found guilty on all charges six days before I was to be sentenced, six days before the sentencing. I was, they produce a pre-sentencing report, which establishes the maximum and minimum time that you would spend in prison. And that report, the minimum amount of time I would be spending in prison was 15 years, maximum 27. So when I walked into sentencing, I thought that was the best I could do. But the Supreme Court, six days before I was to be sentenced, defined a single word in the money laundering uh, statute. And it had been going through the legal um, steps up until that point for almost five and a half years. And it finally got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled and defined a word. The word was proceeds in that statute. And my attorney read the, the findings from the Supreme Court and he said, I think the way they define this word, they define it in a way which makes it so it's not applicable in your case. So we wrote a motion to the judge asking the judge to set aside the money laundering charges based on the Supreme Court decision that happened six days before I was to be sentenced. So walking into sentencing, the best I could have expected to receive was 15 years in prison. Not a young man. That could have been a life sentence, actually. Hmm. So the judge comes in, we stand, sit, and he starts by saying, I'm going to deviate from the mandatory. And as soon as he said that, my attorney groaned and the paralegal on my other side started to cry. That was not a good sign, by the way. Oh, my gosh. Come to find out that this judge had deviated from the mandatory in the past, but it was usually upward. So they thought I was going to, he was going to go beyond the 27 years. But the judge, in, he, he agreed with my attorney and the, the motion that he made. And there were five money laundry charges. So anytime you get money that you're not entitled to, you put it into a legitimate business account and you use that account to pay legitimate business expenses. That's laundering dirty money to clean money. So however you disperse the money is a different charge. So if you write a check, that's one charge. If you play by credit card, that's another charge. If you spend cash, that's another charge. So five of the, um, the eight charges were the money laundering charges. So um, the judge did rule that that made it so that the money laundering charges were not applicable in my case, which brought those out, which reduced the amount of time that I, in the, in the mandatory, the minimum amount of time was, um, 47 months. And he actually ended up sentencing me to 24 months, which is almost half. So, and it, it, I, I show a slide and it's uh, from the transcript. The judge actually states that a, a verdict in either way could have been supported in this case. He wouldn't set aside the jury's verdict, but he would modify the sentencing accordingly. And to be honest with you, did me a great service. Had he set the jury's verdict aside, the prosecution would have gotten an automatic appeal. We would have gone through the whole process over again. And oh, by the way, that word was redefined in the judicial branch six weeks afterward so that it would again reapply in my case. So I had a six day, six week window to be sentenced or I'd still be in prison today. Wow. So tell me too. Okay. So let's, let's rubber meets the road. Listeners are listening in and you have a full presentation where there's lots of stuff to cover, but give me a couple things that people need to do. I mean, you already gave us one with the, um, with the uh, seven step compliance for government payment, but uh, give me a couple more if you don't mind. So one of the more basic things that I see when I audit and one of the things I also go to the insurance meetings. So I kind of get behind the curtain uh, so I can see what the insurance consultants, the ones who work for the insurance, they have meetings as well. You can go to those and they talk about what they see as fraud and abuse in today's dental world. 
and radiographs are a huge one. So in order to take a radiograph, they should be deemed medically necessary. I'll audit the practices fairly often, and sometimes I'll see in the clinical record where there's a notation, x-rays are not due. And when I see that, I will ask the person who made that notation, can you tell me what that means? And I hope that they tell me the doctor reviewed the patient's history, some of the risk factors, and determined at this point the patient would not benefit from the radiographs. I ask that question, and the answer I always get is what? The insurance will not pay for them. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought when you said that real quick, when you said the answer was what, and I think you were rhetorically hoping that I'd answer (laughs) it, but I actually thought that you meant that the answer is the the hygienist saying what? (laughs) Well, well, yeah, that that's I'll get that and that too. X-rays are taken because they are deemed medically necessary for that patient as they present with the condition they have. And if you want a a supportive help for that, the ADA and the FDA in 2008, they updated in 2012, have this 17-page document that establishes a criterion for exposing patients to radiographs. And they actually have a grid that has patients' age and some of the risk factors. There's a box there that says, this patient under this circumstances, this would be the normal radiographs. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do exactly what they say, but it does help to establish a baseline. And can you deviate from that if the doctor feels that's necessary? Absolutely, that's the case. So number one, they need to be medically necessary. Number two, that they are described appropriately with the codes that are used and that those radiographs are clinically acceptable. Meaning that that radiograph that you've taken should meet the criteria necessary to pass a proficiency in dental school, hygiene school, assisting school. Hold on. Let me specify. If it's not, it's, it's not as though that's illegal. You're just saying you can't bill for it. Um, yeah, you can. Um, I mean, let's just say someone accidentally takes a radiograph that's not uh, clinically acceptable. acceptable. It, that's, not, that's not jail worthy. It's, it's jail worthy if you bill for it. It, correct. Right. Uh, so you, if you bill the insurance company, you bill for a worthless service. Yes. So it, that that has no value, and you've billed for the insurance company as if it were diagnostic. So films that are billed for that are non-diagnostic would be considered fraudulent if you billed for them. Yes. I encourage practices to adopt codes in their in their offices that are linked to non-diagnostic radiographs. And I'm not about punishing anybody. I want us all to get better. We all should be working to get better. But you can use that list and tie it to the person who's taking them. And you want that person to be as well-versed and efficient and proficient about taking those x-rays as possible. So if you have a a person on your team who only captures an appropriate film 60% of the time, that's problematic. Oh, so it's kind of like the, the, the clinician's RBI. Uh, you're, you're, you're doing stats on how often they're hitting the ball instead of missing or how often Correct. they're throwing strikes instead of uh, balls. Absolutely. And like I said, I, I'm not into uh, punishing anybody. And I'll give you an example. Um, for example, patient comes in, complains of pain on the upper left-hand side. Doctor takes a quick look. Looks like number 15 may have a, a fairly deep lesion. Ask the assistant to take the PA. The assistant takes the PA. The first one, it's not really good. So the second one's taken and it's worse than the first. That may not not happen in your part of the country. Third Hmm. one's taken and it's perfect. So how many you bill for? That would be one. How many do you make notes that were taken? I would hope that you would make note that there were two that were taken that were non-diagnostic. And, you know, let's face it, in today's world, our teams are are bright. They, They do what they do very effectively and efficiently. And that individual who's firing those x-rays, number one, they're going to delete or not show the doctor. Number two, same thing. They're certainly not going to show the doctor. But the third one, they'll alert the doctor. Go ahead and take a look at the film. It's ready. And the doctor may never know how many films were actually or how many attempts were taken to take that film. But who does know? The assistant and the patient. And if that patient is is sitting there and the, the team member has to have three, four times to take a good film. What does that suggest to that patient? Um, they're, they're not very good at what they're doing. So in the chart, they should write how many attempts were made and then how, what would you call the other one? How many clinically acceptable radiographs were? I, I would, I would, I would 
make notation PA number one, and then non-diagnostic PAs two. You can track that in your software as well. Like I said, just add a code for the non-diagnostic radiograph and I'd review those. And, you know, sometimes our patients refuse radiographs in my part of the country. That ever happen in your part of the country, Chad? Yes, occasionally. But I'm, I'm thankful that it doesn't happen as often as people in other areas complain that it does. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just maybe giving a patient an out on that. If they're in, they're concerned about exposure to radiographs and they've been in your office and they had a PA taken and it took four attempts to get that and you're suggesting they get a full mouth series and that's 14 to 16 films and they do the math and they're going to take four attempts on each of those. Can you see where that might taint that patient's right. perception of whether or not those are necessary? I'm just throwing, oh, that, absolutely. Out there. Yeah. I'm just throwing I, that out there. And if you don't know, you don't know. As a consumer, I can say that would taint me for sure. I would have, mm -hmm. I would have an opinion. Yeah, exactly. So like I said, one and done as much as possible. Use that as a way to be able to help improve your efficiency in the way you do things and your accuracy. So number one, that they're mes medically necessary. That needs to be established in the clinical record. Number two, that they were taken and appropriate. And number three, there needs to be a notation that the doctor read them. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Because if it's not in your clinical record, it didn't happen. It's one thing to take them. But if the record does not indicate that the doctor reviewed them, that could be problematic as well because you've not finished with what is required for that service. It's expected that you take them and you review them and you diagnose as a result of what you review. And yeah. a lot of people don't make notation there and don't take this as being down on hygiene. I love hygienists. If they told me yes. I had to steal somebody's mouth, I would shoot my brains out probably. No, that's a little <laughs> <laughs> well, but 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 Dr. Roy, you you know that like when when we're um, when we're making notes and we want to write the, that uh, we've reviewed them, or I I put in mind uh, you know let's whatever radiographs, but uh, radiographs uh, ordered, made, mm -hmm. and interpreted, and right. and these days it's it's way easier to have an auto note that that can spit that out but that at the same Absolutely. time we have to make sure that we review that because if for some reason i don't know it it it, it wasn't um it wasn't interpreted i mean you know but then the auto note will say oh yeah it interpreted it and then later on that could be an issue when when uh, they bring up in court if they said did you actually review this and you know technically you know if it's written in the chart then it was done and so you know, so far as legal is, is saying, yeah, we covered it. But if, if then someone said, well, if you covered it, why didn't you see all five of these cavities on these teeth? And now all of a sudden it's like, uh, yeah, it's failure to diagnose. So if yeah. you're going to have, a so you can't just put it on autopilot is, is what I'm getting. No, at. You yeah. absolutely cannot. It has to have happened. And there yes. again, if you have a tendency to have an auto note and you don't do everything that's in that auto note, that's going to make it so that they're going to, that'll put a wrench into anything that you're trying to establish. So as far as make sure that even if you have templates, you don't necessarily have to, they're good. I recommend templates to a degree, but they need to be accurate. When they ask you the question, do you always do that? The question should always be yes. And then sure. actually do it because uh, like I said, you could, you think you could be above that and just lie and say, oh yeah, you know, because the chart note says it. So for all the purposes, you know, legally you're covered, but then they could ask a follow-up question and all of a sudden it shows that you're hosed. Well, they will, they will actually ask, they will actually ask team members. Mm -hmm. Well, they will have interviewed them prior to, and the team member will be asked, does the doctor always review those films? And the answer would be no. And that, right. That is, you're dead in water. Yes. That's horrible. And, you know, I was, I was talking about the hygienist in the only two states where hygiene, hygienists can practice independently is Oregon and um, Nevada uh -huh. with, uh, with permission from the board. They have to test it out where they can do that. Otherwise, hygienists cannot order radiographs. It's only the doctor can establish the need for the radiographs and only the doctor can read them. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. I mean, I that was, it was, it was quite a while ago. So I just, that's, that's 
really important for people to to know from the team the team training not just the doctor being aware but having the team understand as well what their parameters are yeah and actually it's problematic if you have a standing protocol in your practice where you take i don't know bite wings every year or you take full mouth series every three years or panorex all the patients are not the same you cannot base your radiographic assays based on what the insurance is going to pay for or assuming that all the patients are the same because they're not you know would it be appropriate to take bite wings every six months on a child who has rampant decay and is non-compliant with their hygiene y- yeah how about an individual who's 25 and has no fillings in their mouth and are healthy and are always good about keeping their appointments should you take bite wings every year on that patient probably not so it's it's all based on need for the patient and the documentation needs to establish that need and the films need to be appropriate i just want the audience to know like there's so much to learn from you that this was just one snippet if this didn't blow your mind and you're just like nope we're fully compliant there's plenty of <laughs> There's plenty of other things, uh, you know, that Dr. Roy's uh, presentation helps uh, bring up. Aren't you working with, um, it, like, you've worked alongside with, uh, oh, shoot, uh, Charles Blair? Blair, mm-hmm. yeah. I actually helped to edit the newsletter. He, if you get his newsletter, I do at least two of the articles yep. um, for each of those publications. I help to edit the books before we go in. I have a yep. great relationship with Dr. Blair. He's a great guy. Brilliant as far as the billing coding piece. His book yep. is great, too. Wow. Um, one of the things you, you need to stay current, you need to attend the meetings for the code maintenance committee. Those where the uh, codes are established. That's in Chicago. It's held every year in March and that they go through the submissions for requests for code changes. And you are able to hear the back and forth and the intent from the people who submit those um, codes and you understand how it's to be interpreted because if you're not careful, you can misinterpret the meaning and the, the reason for that code. So like I said, it, it, ignorance is no excuse. You need to know how to use it and where it's applicable and where it's not. Yeah. Wow. You have given us so much. I feel like I've taken one bite out of a lion today and you've given all our listeners, you know what I mean, Chad? <laughs> well, dentists don't like to claim that we've shot any lions or anything. <laughs> we're, we're not going to touch that, but you know, metaphorically yeah. speaking, sure. Like, right. Of course. Of course. Well, I feel like, I, I feel like this is a lot to, a lot to unpack and you've uh, Roy given, uh, given our listeners lots of really quick actionable things that they can start their journey towards compliance today. Um, and thank you for that very, very much. Uh, everybody listening, you can, you can see Roy, um, again, it smiles at sea coming up, and then you can check out his website, which we'll put in the notes too for uh, the upcoming speaking engagements. Roy, we have we have a couple more questions for you. Can we can we uh, continue? Oh, absolutely! Don't stump the the, the speaker though. That could be problematic. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> what 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 is one of your favorite books that you've been reading lately? Um, exactly what to say? Um, the magic words. It's by Phil Jones. And it, it is brilliant. It's, it's an easy read. It's a short book, but it just talks about some of the verbal um, skills that we need to help um, communicating to patients. And one of the, one of the quick things that I, I learned that really impressed me is if you're trying to encourage, say, a patient to accept treatment, rather than saying, you need this, Start by saying something like, this may not be for you, but, and especially for cosmetic purposes, that gives the patient an out. They start by thinking, you don't think this is for me? Why do you not think this is for me? I wonder why you think I wouldn't want this. And it's just, it just tweaks it enough so that people look at things and approach it a little bit different way rather than being sold. I hate to be sold. I love to buy. Most people in America are the same way. I hate to walk into a, 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 a car dealership and have them breathing down my back, but I see a vehicle that I like and it's like, hmm, well, that's a pretty cool car. Well, because so, people get what they want, but we yeah. don't like getting what we need. Correct. And so how did you word that again as an example? This may not be for you, but. Okay. So that it takes the pressure off. So they have an out. They can look at it and you say, you're right, it's not for me. But it actually sets it up so it opens their mind and go, hmm, I wonder why they don't think that's for me because I'm a pretty good guy. I, you know, I, so it, like I said, it just kind of um, 
spins it around, puts it on its head. And uh, another one is Crucial Conversations. Oh, I love that. Uh, mm-hmm. Isn't that great? Kelly, um, Carrie Patterson. Uh, that's a great book. It's a, a, a way of actually, and there's another one. If, as She also does Crucial uh, um, crucial confrontations as well as crucial conversations. Mm-hmm. So those are both written by. Oh, I haven't read crucial confrontations. Yeah, both those are good by the same author, Carrie Patterson. All right, so here's the last question we like to ask all of our guests. Okay, but it may not be for you. <laughs> <laughs> Who said he's not trainable? Who right, said? right, right. I, it wasn't. <laughs> fully smooth but i thought well i could fit that in right there to make an application you know a little application all right so you choose one or the other but you can't choose both and if you choose both you get docked three points and i don't know what three points matters but here you go okay bacon or eggs bacon there you have it folks another bacon Well, Dr. Roy, thanks so much for being on our show today. I know a lot of people are definitely going to benefit from this and they would all the more benefit from not just this few minute teaser, but also going to your lectures whenever you're in town for them. You're everywhere. So there's somewhere (laughs) nearby them that they could come listen to you. And if not, smiles at sea. Yeah. And um, if somebody does, as a result of this, come to one of the programs that I do, please introduce yourself and say, hey, I I heard you Yes. Be yes. Great. Yep. All right, buddy. Well, uh, good talking with you again. I can't wait to see you in person whenever that happens. Uh, hopefully not at the airport where I missed my flight like last time in, in Charlotte, but it was, uh, it was good eating that burger with you. I mean, oh, you, yeah. you watching me eat that burger. I don't know. Go for it, man. <laughs> All right. Well, Reagan, again, thanks for a special co-hosting with us here. I really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, giving us different insight and different questions as well. So thanks, Reagan. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right, y'all take care and we'll see you next week for the next podcast for Everyday Practices. Bring your lunch or take us to the gym again next week to improve your everyday practices. Also, subscribe on iTunes, follow us on social media, and sign up for our email list. Now get out there and win with Everyday Practices.